In this video today, we are going to show you guys how to make a fire table. That's right, this is outdoor dining with a heated feature for the winter time. It only takes a couple of days to whip together. It seats 10, it's COVID friendly. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, so our fire pit design is actually designed to be really quite simple. We have created a hole by not installing tile. We have our line installed first for the gas. So we aren't going to ever need a propane tank. It's going to be hooked up directly to the propane tanks that supply our furnace in this area. And then when we're done, we're going to put this lead stone facade on the outside. We're using this in three different areas of the patio area. So it's like a design element and to tie together with the cedar barrel hot tub and the cedar porch. So this ought to work really well. All we're going to do is install the first course very much like a retaining wall. And this is really the thing. We have to get the first course incredibly level. If it's not level, none of this is going to work. Me lucky. All right. Let's see how this one works out now. Yeah. So the cool thing here is the stone that we're using is uh, four by tens and the tile that we're using is 24 inch actual. So we can lay all this out and put all this together and have a, the odd gap on the, each side. We'll stagger those gaps. And it allows me to install all of this base for this table, which is going to be seven feet long. Okay. So I've got a six foot base with a seven foot table designed for seating for three people on each side with the fire pit right down the middle. It's a pretty simple layout. And if you mix the right materials in the design process, you save yourself a ton of work. I don't have to cut all the blocks. I don't have a quick cut out here today. It won't be necessary. Just me with my mallet. And your Maddie. And Matt and the sun. Beautiful day. I'm working. I'm not just sitting here. I'm just... <laughs> Matt does all my physical work for me so I don't die. And that's important. Now, just like with the retaining wall, we're going to glue all of these together. And that ought to make this really awesome four season kind of environment. Okay. Now, look how perfect this is fitting. I'm absolutely amazing myself. Sometimes, Maddie, life is just that good. So when you're out buying your stone, if you buy actual 24 inch stone and you buy four by 10 brick, this is like a no brainer, right? It's guaranteed to work. This is where experience pays. Lots of videos on YouTube of guys that make fire pits. You've never worked with the materials they're using before. And those are great for learning what not to do. <laughs> but if you're looking for a tutorial on how to build one and it's going to work out perfect the first time, you're in the right place. Keep them coming. Just taking names here. Oh, Thank you want to hand them? Oh, well, I'm waiting for it. I might as well, eh? Okay. Ah, once you get the first layer nice and level, you just got to double stack. Now, we're going to just double stack and then we're going to change the location of this block to the other side. And then we're going to alternate our joint structure a little bit. That way we have some overlap and everything's going to get glued and tied together. We won't have any um, uh, vertical places that can actually separate. All right, Matt, let's rock. I want to rock. <laughs> All right, so it's just like my father used to say, that boy's a couple bricks short of a full load. <laughs> Obviously, I'm going to the store to grab a few more. They're in stock, it doesn't matter. And because we're doing a facade only here on the outside, it don't, I don't care if they come in pink, it's gonna grab a few more stones, finish my structure, glue it together, and then we're installing two of these bad boys. We're gonna be making a custom concrete countertop, and don't worry, it's not like the first one I did a few years ago. We've perfected the art since then, and I'm gonna show you how to cast it so that this drops in place and makes a quick connect to the gas line coming up here. 
One, two, think about it. Mm -mm -mm. Gonna be some sexy. And you can do this yourself. It's not that hard. Now what makes this whole system simple is the fact that we've built our base. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just try to keep it as flush as you can. Here's our facade stone. They make it in outside corners. All you gotta remember is when you're sticking it on a corner, alternate your joint. And then the next row up, go along on the other side. It's really not that difficult. We're gonna make the same cement that we use for the patio here, which is a Carabond with Carolastic additive. So it's a non-modified cement and we modify it on site, okay? So we have an adhesive property that does really well in four season climate. Now I'm just gonna spray the sucker down, make sure she's good and wet. Now we're ready to install the stone. So just to give you an idea, this is one of the tools that uh, I forgot. I'm not gonna throw Matt under the bus on this one. I left this in the pail yesterday and it was covered in the cement. So now it's completely dried. I want you to check out the flexibility in this product. It's on a steel blade. It's not breaking off. You ever seen a cement with that kind of flexibility? That's why we're doing it, okay? Carabond with Carolastic has this kind of extreme temperature, expansion, contraction, flexibility, and holds its bond. This stuff is money in the bank. So just a couple quick notes, things to think about while you're working outside. Your patio is going to have a slope. Your fire table shouldn't. So, double check, look around for the low corner and start your build there. And I'm going to suggest a quick little cheat so you don't have to cut every single stone in the fireplace. Go ahead and get a box of wedges, okay? These are available at the Home Depot, just leveling tile system, just the wedges. What we're going to do, we're going to use these wedges in varying degrees to level out our stone as it comes along so that Hopefully, if we get lucky, we won't have to do any cuts, but if we do, we got our trusty wet saw here ready to roll, if we need it when we get there. Now, if you're looking at this and you're going, well, that's a lot of pails. <laughs> There's a method to the madness here. One pail I have here marked with my fluid line, because it's one gallon of this mixture, which is the Carab Carolastic, <laughs> with every half bag of the Carabond. So I have two pails set aside where I, I split the bag into two pails evenly. I've got a, another pail, that's my water, my, my fluid level for the Carolastic. And then I put the Carolastic in this pail, and then I put the dry goods in here and I try to keep them separate. And honestly, this stuff is so brutal to work with. It's just so amazing performance wise, but brutal to work with. You're gonna go through a few pails, especially if you're doing this over a couple days. But I just wanted to show you what the products were that we're using. In case you're using this video as a, a how-to demonstration, um, really incredibly important to use the right product. Now, if you're not in a four-season climate, check with a company local to you. You might be able to get away with not using such an extreme measure. Each one of these uh, five-gallon drums is 200 bucks. And so if you can avoid that expense living in the south, then I would say try. But for me, there's just no way around it. I'm trying to get a, a Miami look in uh, Ottawa climate, and if you want that, you gotta pay for it. And now we let it sit for 10 minutes. And we mix it again. Do not skip this step. It is way too soupy right now. It needs some time to set up. And after all the material in here is activated and it thickens up, then it'll be beautiful to work with. Woo! Oh, our 10 minutes are up. Look how thick that's getting. It's like lava in here. Oh yeah. Now we'll mix this up real quick and then we'll get started. We're just going to take our trowel, put it on like we're purging, and then we'll trowel it in in a second. I'm just using the cardboard to control the, the extra material. Warning, this is going to make a mess. <laughs> All right, and I'm using a 3 8 by quarter inch trowel. It's a good size for any lead stone. 
the idea here is to try to get enough material on here and step it down so you can do a few rows in the corner and then build across. We've got our little thingamajiggers. I'm going to start a little bit rough and loose here with it. I'm going to stick these in. As I pull out the cardboard, I'm going to go start nice and tall here. All right, this is our low end. That's it. Not much to it, eh? Oh, okay. And then we'll alternate long side there, long side here. Okay. Nice. I'll go with a short piece. Yeah. Then we'll go with a short outside corner. I know, it's almost ridiculous how easy this looks, isn't it? I'm not getting very good bond here. If you don't get a good grab, just do the back of the dial, okay? And, of course, the most important thing is getting good bond. So whatever that takes, whatever that looks like. Here, I'm going to do half and half. Yeah. Smarty pants. You can see the back of this stone, though. This is from MCI. It's like pebbled. It's not smooth. Okay, so as long as there's enough material in my contact, we'll just show you what we got. That's all the contact I'm getting. So, sometimes I can just tell by the way I set it in if I'm making contact. If not, I'll just back butter the tile. Experience will tell you this, okay? You don't have to do every one. But, if you're running into issues, by all means, add a little cement. This product is not gonna fail if you use more instead of less. But it could fail if you don't use enough. Now, I have seen a lot of videos on how to make countertops. I even done a video on how to make a countertop. That one was not as successful as I would have liked as far as the outcome. But at the time, the client wanted a countertop that was food safe. And at that time, that was the only thing on the market as far as material combination that would subdue that. We're not doing a food safe countertop today. So we get to be a little bit more finessed and sexy. We're going to make the mold right here. And then we're going to take it off the mold and invert it and put it on the fire pit, bring the gas lines to it. I just wanted to go over the materials that we're using in this situation because it's gonna be a combination of some other different videos you might have seen. I've designed this process to be very user-friendly for you guys, okay? So I'm not using materials that you can't get at the local box store. Everything I'm using here, I picked up at Home Depot yesterday morning, except for the fireplace inserts. Those are gonna be available on Amazon. That's where I bought mine. We'll put that link in the description below. But this is a really easy thing to do. The fireplace inserts came with just a few days. Everything else is available off the shelf. So if you're looking to do a project like this, we'll make it as easy as possible for you to be successful. You're gonna need some black silicone. And the reason you want black is because you wanna be able to see the contrast between the silicone and the melamine that you're making your mold on. So get a color, don't just get clear or white, it'll drive you crazy. You're gonna need a caulking gun to use that. You're gonna need a glue gun, all right? So I picked this glue gun up. It's not an expensive tool. I think it was like 25 or 30 bucks. You're gonna need some good glue sticks, okay? If you get the sticks that are designed for the gun, same brand, it makes your life easy, all right? And you're gonna to wanna to get this little tool here. This is a caulking applicator, and it has a rounded edge. And it'll help because later on when I show you, this will become real valuable. Um, there's a lot of different sheets and hacks that other people are using. But if you just buy this, then you have the tool for life. And anytime you're doing caulking work, it'll give you a really nice edge. Now, I'm going to save the reveal of all of these really cool features to a little bit later in the video, but I will tell you this. I'm doing a seven foot countertop with two fire features right down the middle. So I'm gonna have a six feet of fire and I'm gonna have glass protectors in front of the fire features so that people can sit at the counter with the fire going and have dinner and have a glass of wine and not run the risk of reaching over and putting your hand in the flame. All right, now everything I bought off the shelf at Home Depot and I'm gonna show you how to assemble it so that it makes your life simple. Here we go. Let's just get started. Okay, so step one is we're going to be building this countertop to the same thickness as the insert. That will enable us all kinds of flexibility with our design 
And if you can check that out, it's a two inch thick. No big surprise, right? So we're gonna make our countertop two inches thick. Makes it everything really simple. So what we're gonna use is we're gonna use a sheet of melamine as our base, which will be officially the top of the counter. And then we're going to use the second sheet of melamine to cut the material that we need to create our form, okay? So we're gonna go with two inches as a rule. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the melamine on the bottom as my, my cutoff area. And I'm just taking the second sheet to create a straight edge. What I'm gonna do is just kind of do it like a reverse table saw. Working with large material like this, it's really difficult to use a table saw. So use your skill saw or your circular saw and you can create a straight edge guide with a piece of material so you can cut straight, all right? And all you gotta do is measure off from the inside of the blade to the outside of the table that'll be running against the other material. Now that is exactly inch and a half, okay? So, I need inch and a half for that space plus two inches of material. So I'm gonna set this back at three and a half inches on both ends. we go. Clamp them together. Okay. Now, make sure I'm not gonna be cutting into anything. All we do here is make sure that the table is right up against the other material, okay? Release the guard, and then we'll just drive it down the side. kind of what I call a poor man's track saw. The only time you really need a track saw per, per se on a job site is if you're doing really specific detailed cuts. Like, that is perfectly good, loving it. I'm gonna cut the second one exactly the same, set this up at three and a half inches, and then clamp it on. Very important that the entire perimeter of the mold that we're working with is set the same height because then we can screed the cement later to make a nice finish. Okay, let's do another run. So my design calls for a 44 inch wide table. The bottom sheet, now that I've ripped off those six inches, is exactly 44. So now I'm gonna just take a couple of pieces off this edge here so I can finish my mold. I'll set this up again, same thing. Three and a half, right? Now, if you're watching this video and you've got a cute little glue gun and you have little white sticks for it, be careful, it's not the same thing. This is not a craft gun. This is designed for construction. We use this for quite a few things. Here we go. Now it's set up and it's getting melted. We use glue gun on, on construction sites for a few things, attaching porcelain fixtures to a wall and then we silicone it. One of them is for electric heat mats. On concrete floors, you can actually put a drop of glue and then set the tracks for the wires to run in with a glue gun or use the glue gun on the wire itself if you need to. Um, and then, of course, in construction like this, this is perfect. It's for getting things attached quick in a hurry. So in this situation, I'm gonna use a few drops of the glue to hold this in place so that it sits in the right spot while I throw a few brad nails in it. Now, the whole process of creating the form is three things. It's glue, a couple brad nails, and then the silicone that goes on the interior. I'll show you that in a second, but just so you know, you're not relying solely on the glue. So don't make one huge long strip, because by the time you get to the other end, it'll have dried at the beginning, okay? So just a few quick drips. Set it back on the stand and get this thing in place. 
and you'll have just a couple of seconds to work with it. Get it to the edge, nice and flush. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is going to be the size of the table now. Because <laughs> it ain't moving. All right. <laughs> Here we go. Now we'll do the all four sides because we're doing one large perimeter table. I'm just going to get all four pieces on and then we'll talk about how to lay out and measure all the rest of the interior components of this. And here we go. Now, hot glue is a little messy and it is a little stringy as you can tell. Okay, so make sure you clean it all off when you're done. Now, one of the reasons you can't use anything else other than melamine, plywood will leave, um, it'll leave a texture of the wood on it. It also absorbs the water from the concrete. And so what melamine is, it's a semi-non-porous material, okay, that comes in a sheet good. The reason we're using this is because when we silicone all the joints, the concrete will stay wet while it's curing. We're not going to pull all the moisture up because it's a Portland cement mix we're using. And if you let it dry too fast, it's actually quite weak. So allowing it to stay wet while it's curing is the key here. So we really want to make sure that we're protecting all the area where the concrete's getting poured, that we're not pulling all the water back out, which is why melamine is awesome. Also, when it's all done, the concrete will lift right off the smooth surface real easily. And because it's so smooth, it doesn't leave any of its own texture behind. It's a win, win, win. All right, so here are the components of the fire table. We have two of these bad boys, okay? And the idea is that will be your fire pit. That'll look pretty. We're gonna pour the concrete. Now I picked up these glass pieces. It's part of a rail system that they're selling at the Home Depot, here in Canada anyway. I don't know if it's in the United States, but uh, other companies are making these things. So look around if you can't find it. Basically it's designed to be, like have a top and bottom rail. It's safety glass, okay? And it's just a couple inches longer than the pit that I'm using. So I'm gonna set it up where I can install one of these on each side of each fire pit on the table, all right? Now warning, just for fun, I popped outside. I tried to cut this on my wet saw to see if it would work. I did that for you. <laughs> you can watch that real quick right here. Yeah, that didn't work at all. So when you're configuring and you're thinking you're through your process, because I mean, not everybody's gonna do exactly what I'm doing here. Remember, you can't cut safety glass. I don't care how hard you try. They can only make it to size, okay? So like when you go to a, a glass store to get safety glass for any reason, every piece that you buy is actually custom made. So this is a great way to get around that by using something that's already custom made that's close in size. 32 inch fire pit, 36 inch glass, all right? And then I'm gonna need a 36 inch aluminum U-channel that I can set into the countertop. I'm gonna cut that on the saw right now and then we'll assemble all this and lay it out. We'll see if we like what we see. Okay, so. So the glass itself is 36 and three quarters. We're gonna cut just a hair longer than that so we don't have any issues. Okay, now this aluminum channel is a half inch channel and the glass is 7 16 so this should be a perfect fit we'll know when we're all finished like i said i'm just designing this out of my head i haven't actually built this before oh and any basic saw will cut aluminum without any difficulty and not destroy the blade so no worries there and it requires power Okay, which I stole for my hot glue gun. That's two. And of course we need four. 36 and three quarters, right? Well, at least I have my marker and my knife on me now. Okay. Safety squints activated. Okay, so what we're gonna do real quick is we're just gonna confirm that our glass fits this track before we get too overly excited. All right, so that works good. A Little bit of wiggle room as I said, but it might be necessary. My hunch is that under all the weight of that cement, because it's gonna be installed into the table, it might wanna move just a bit. Yeah. 
either way I'm sure we'll be fine. So I'm going to just mark a center point here. I'm going to use a laser level to help put all this together. Uh, it's going to be 22 and 3 eighths is our center mark. And we'll measure both sides. Okay. Now, for all of you who are watching this video and haven't seen a lot of our content, I'm telling you right now, this is one of my favorite tools. This is what takes you from a DIYer to a pro. And in a lot of cases, you can embarrass the pros if you use a laser level to work with. Now, because we're doing something rather complex, we're gonna want a couple other marks here. Let's go with interior measurement. I'm 95 and a half. Just a little bit off the four foot mark is my center. So I'm actually 47. Okay. I'm going to mark my center for that. And then I can have my fire pits equal distance away. We're going to just visualize how this is going to look. And then we'll get it all in perfect location. All right. Yeah, I'm pretty cool with that. Okay, so we're gonna go with uh, four and a half inches off center for both of those. And the way that we're gonna make the location is really simple. I've got my laser line, I've got my center, I marked these edges. I'm just gonna hold this up. And that screw is right in the center. Move this until the laser level is right on that screw. Perfect, square. There we are. Now that is absolutely gorgeous. Okay. Now we're not actually making the hole in the table that big. We're gonna make the hole in the table about this big. We'll go to the middle of the flange, okay? So it's a lot easier for us to set this in place. But just by tracing this out, it'll give me a point of reference when I'm setting my insulation that I'm gonna use, the rigid insulation. I'm gonna cut and install that onto the, onto the table here, because it's also two inches thick, and it will keep the concrete from filling up those holes while we're pouring, all right? So that's done, we can get rid of these. The only thing left for us to do is set up the glass. 32 and a half inches from the outside, and this is 36 and three quarters. Which is the same as two quarters, all right? So we are actually four and a quarter longer. When we cut that in half, I'm gonna go two and an eighth. Double the number on the bottom, and I'll give you the right measure. So now, I'm gonna go two and an eighth inches longer than that, which takes me to here. Okay. And I also wanna have, let's go something simple like one inch. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. Let's do the same all the way around. We'll set all of these off one inch. We'll mark the outside. Okay. Perfect. We'll put a mark on the end. Two and an eighth. Two and an eighth. And the reason I'm getting all these measurements on here, because I'm going to actually end up hot gluing these tracks to the surface so that they're embedded and flush with the material when it's all finished. Truth is guys, when you're working with concrete and you're doing this kind of a mold, you can install anything into the countertop you like. And you can be as creative as you wanna be. Just gotta remember, whatever it goes against this actually ends up being the surface of the counter, okay? So now, we've got all of our measurements, we're ready to go, time to get the hot glue back. Now, we just came back from a break, so even, we're, we're even a little confused with where we are in this process. Um, these are my cutoffs, all right? They come in eight foot lengths. So I got roughly three feet and then a little bit left over. I'm gonna glue this down just to create an edge. So when I'm laying these, they're perfectly square, okay? And I'm, I'm just gonna go a little dab on both ends, okay? And drop those on the line. There, and then the same for the other bees. Oh, we had a couple seconds to get that perfect. 
that is really cool. All right, there we go. Now, because this is where the glass gets inserted, we have to invert it to install it on the countertop. So we're gonna use this as our stop once that glue dries. Okay. Whoo! So, <laughs> we're gonna do a couple of dabs on this edge, and then I'm gonna lay it down, and then on the back side, I'm gonna do a whole run of glue just to hold it in place, okay? So let's see if we can get this to work for us. I'm gonna go like that, line it up on the marks. Okay, wow, that's awesome. This is gonna be like spot welding here a little bit. Just want a couple of spots. It's important that that doesn't go anywhere. Whew. Okay, here we are. Okay, so a quick pro tip for you. The trigger on this actually grabs the stick in and around this region here in the gun. And you'll see that the end of that glue gun is now over here. This is kind of, it's, you see how this is? The way the glue gun works is when you pull the trigger, the lever is pushing the glue from back here. And when the stick gets to the end, it doesn't work anymore. So, all you do, put your new glue stick in, all right? And you can use the, the trigger, or you can just push to get a nice solid line without having to use the trigger. <laughs> this makes it a lot cleaner, a lot more consistent, keep even pressure, and you can work just as fast as the glue is melting. Okay, so this glue actually doesn't bond to the aluminum to the point where it's hard to clean off. So I'm gonna just use this to fill up the holes on the end of this track. And you're gonna to have to do a couple of applications here, right, because you can't just keep filling this full of hot glue. It'll never set. Okay, so give it a few minutes after we fill the holes, and we'll go around, we'll fill it all again. <sighs> and then we'll be on to the next step. Um, so now I'm just gonna throw some brad nails from underneath. Just every foot or so. Make sure you use your safety squints when working with nails like tools like this. Now we're gonna have three individual ways of holding this all together now. I'm gonna have brad nails, I'm gonna have hot glue, and then the next step is to silicone everything together. Hopefully with all that being said and done, that'll be enough to hold all this bad boy together while it sets up. Now, there's a, uh, Two more steps here. One is the silicone, and the other. Yeah, I like that. The other is the, the rigid pink insulation. We'll do the silicone first. Because it's silicone, make sure you get a gun that has a clean out nozzle, <laughs> preferably not covered in PL Premium. There's <laughs> so much gunk on there, I can't penetrate that tab. Okay, well, that's better. Now the purpose of the silicone is actually, does two things. One, it seals the joints, okay? So that the raw exposed edges of this melamine can absorb water. Two, it creates a rounded edge that when you invert the countertop, it's a nice soft round edge on the top of the counter. Nothing wrong with having a nice soft uh, round edge. And number three, it holds it all together. Silicone on melamine has much better bond strength than hot glue. It's still not amazing, because when you take the countertop off, it'll just peel right out. But it is a little extra added precaution. Now the goal here is to get just enough to do the job that you don't have to work it too much. Okay? If you cut the edge and you put a nice bead on, then you don't have to hardly work this material at all. Now we get our little tool out and I'll show you how this works. Okay, so we have a short and a wide side bead. I'm gonna go with the wide side. You'd be surprised how much material is actually sitting there like this. So just put it in the corner and then give it a nice gentle pull. And that'll make that curve very consistent. I 
I did a real gentle pull and now I'm using a little bit more pressure. Just wanted to make sure that I flattened out the edge first before I start pressing it all in. Now, there are other videos on the internet they show you, you know, use wax, use this, use the other. Scrape it all clean and then peel off the extra. And if you don't put too much on, there's nothing to really clean off. So just use a little bit of care and you'll be fine. But if you want to clean it all off after the fact, you can. This old house does a pour. And they have the professional countertop guy. And he's showing all of his, he's using uh, wax and that sort of stuff. Feel free to follow some of that advice if it makes you more comfortable. I'm real comfortable with the silicone, so I'm going to just go by hand. Okay, so I'm going to also use a small little bead on both sides of the aluminum track here. Not for decoration, more of a paranoia issue. Remember, when you pour this, you don't get to see what's going on underneath. When it's done, it's done. This is going to be a lot of work to then be disappointed that something got, you know, removed during the process. So I'm embedding it in place with silicone as an extra step, just a tiny little bit so that I don't get any material getting underneath that glue and moving this around potentially. Now the goal here, right off the bat, is take a rigid insulation. And the only reason we're using it is because it's rigid and it's light. And so if I fill the hole where I want to have a hole with this stuff and then pour my concrete, it really reduces the total mass that's going to be in there. And I love that. So I'm just taking my knife and this is designed in construction to overlap to help get a better air seal. I'm just going to trim it. Yeah, I just did that with an Olfa knife. If you don't own one of these, you got to check out our Amazon store and pick one up. All right, links in the description, guys. Best knife in construction in the world. Okay, so that gives me two relatively straight edges here. Okay, so my hole, the insert is 32 by almost eight and a half. What we want to do is find something that fills the space and leaves at least a half an inch on both sides so that my concrete will come to here, my finish comes to here because it sits in real nice. Here, I'll just bring this out for reference. Here we go, right? So I want my concrete to come up to about this point on each side. So when we're all done and we set this in, it really sets in without any difficulty. I don't want it sliding around too much. We don't have to do too much to anchor it down and it can just be set in place. And so this is the goal. So we're gonna measure this off. So if I make something seven inches wide, okay, or uh, around 180 millimeters. <laughs> and I'll do the same thing. I'll go 30 and a half, seven by 30 and a half, which is 760 and change. Okay, so 30 and a half by seven inches, piece of cake. We'll cut two of those and then we'll show you, we're just gonna put them in place using a spray adhesive. So Max is over here just trying to wrap his mind around it. When you're doing things backwards, upside down, it can mess with your brain until you've actually seen it completed. But he was going, so how do you drill the rest of the hole later? And I'm like, no, this is two inches thick. This rise here is two inches thick. So now when I pour my concrete, I want to see the foam exposed. Okay, so then I know that when I pull it all apart, the hole is already fully in engaged and everything should be fine. And if that helped anybody, then it was worth saying. Here we go. Seven inches, right? And I'm just going to use this old finger technique here like this. Now this is not finished carpentry, okay? I don't want you getting too worked up over it. One of the reasons why we're going with guesstimates and roughlies and, on and around the measurement is because it doesn't really matter. So much room to wiggle around. If your mark isn't perfect or your cut isn't perfectly straight, it will have no effect at the end of the day. If you need this to be absolutely perfect, again, pull out a straight edge in your saw because you can use a circular saw to cut it. So if the inserts that you buy are going to give you more trouble than this, then that's what I would recommend to do. I've got so much room to play with here. Now you'll see how that knife cuts. It pulls and then it tugs and you be careful that you're thinking every time you pull out a knife, if I go, what am I cutting through? It's a good question to ask yourself every few moments during the day, actually. What am I cutting through if I do that? Because whenever you're using a knife pulling towards yourself under pressure, you want to make sure that you're going to clear your hip, right? Bad day at the office if you don't. If 
you, if you pull it and you cut right through one of your legs. Okay. There we go. Two inserts. And again, it doesn't matter if they're perfect. Now, this particular adhesive I'm going to spray off to the side here. I'm just going to get at both ends just a little bit, and then we're going to use another bead of silicone to hold everything in place so nothing gets underneath. <sighs> it's like silly string. Here we go. And roughly the difference in the gap should be about the same. Ah, done. <laughs> Piece of cake, eh? And roughly about there. Uh, and done. Gotta love a good heavy duty spray. Adhesive spray. Great invention. Man, you can get real creative when you know how to use stuff like this. Of course, this bead here, we're just gonna goop it in. Oh! Now, one thing that I never saw in anybody's video, anywhere in the internet, about concrete counters. When you're done putting your silicone on, you need to let this stuff dry overnight. <laughs> you can't just go to the next step, which is in everybody's video, to just go pour your concrete in here. That's a disaster waiting to happen. So do yourself a favor, give yourself 24 hours for this stuff to dry, at least overnight, okay? I mean, if it's four o'clock in the afternoon and next morning you wanna start, you'll be fine. But give yourself time for this to really set up and cure. Now, I'm not gonna to tool this stuff because I don't need to, right? This is all gonna be hidden, buried underneath that insert. There's no effect here if I don't get it all. That's it, that's the end of day one, okay? The only thing you have to do after this is let it dry, and we'll continue the video like as if it's tomorrow morning. All right guys, it's the next day, everything is nice and dry, and now I'm just trying to make sure that my countertop is completely level. And here's the reason. You can't fill everything to two inches if you have a sloped corner. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah, there is a weakness over here. I knew that. I walked in and I saw it. Here we go. So let's get that taken care of. Oh, all right. Now, only one other thing we got to do before we start mixing up our cement, and that is to vacuum out the interior. We don't want to have any dirt embedded in the finish, right? So that's key. Here we go. All right, for the countertop today, guys, we're going to go with a rapid set cement. It has very fine molecules in it. It's almost a mortar, okay? It's really fine. And this stuff is designed for, uh, well, repairing bridges and stuff like that, okay? It's like really high strength. So, all right, so the cement that we're gonna use to make our countertop is called Rapid Set. It's a cementol product. This is more of a brand name, okay? So if you don't have that available, that's fine. Just keep in mind what you're looking for is a cement with really fine particles. It's more closer to like a mortar looking product. It's designed for um, industrial applications, anchoring products, underlayments. Uh, and it also it says here casting. Ooh, lovely, because we're making a cast. So this is the kind of product we want to use. It doesn't require a whole lot of help, all right? It has like a 9,000 pounds per square inch of strength after it's set and dried. If you mix it at a certain amount of water, because we're just making a countertop though, I'm adding more water for flowability, and you can go up to four and a half liters a bag, okay? So that's a lot of water. That's, that's a full gallon and change. Now, I went out and I bought myself a couple of pails that have got the measurements on them. I'm gonna split the bag into two different pours, okay? We're gonna try to guesstimate half and half. The secret here is we're gonna be mixing this, and instead of pouring it into the set, into my mold, okay? We are going to be using a different system for setting the beginning of it. I'm going to be using a sprayer to get a real continuous, nice coating on the entire mold first before I start make, mixing this up and pouring it in. That way the finish isn't going to have any lines and set lines because it does a set up so fast. It's going to be like the other video that we did where we had layers. You could see it was almost like a sandwich, a cement sandwich. We don't want to have that happen again. So this way, we're gonna up the, up the technique. I'm using my hopper I use for textured ceilings and stipple ceilings, and that's gonna work out great as long as I can finish it and get it washed before it sets. We'll be fine. <laughs> anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna see how this works. This is a much better way of doing a mold than I've done in the past, so I'm kinda looking forward to seeing how this turns out.
Uh, there it is. Uh. I'm gonna wear my mask. <laughs> yep, yeah, that's right. There are no shortage of masks around nowadays. Might as well use it. Now this is not an N95, but honestly, if you catch me on most days of the week, I'm not gonna wear a mask at all. But for this particular case, I figured I might as well try to be a little bit responsible. Okay, so we're gonna use the slow speed mixer. There's the paddle blade. This is ideal for cement, okay? Whenever you're doing this, start off on slow. Don't go too crazy, you'll just end up wearing it all over your shoes. Talk about flowability. You can see all the bubbles forming from the chemical reaction. That's the quick set. That also means that when I'm pouring this particular cement, I'm gonna need some vibration to get rid of the air bubbles. But because we're spraying the beginning, we should have no problem with air bubbles at the surface. So this is my blue hopper. It's basically a spray machine. It gets connected to your compressor. Remember that video I did? I told you all my favorite tools. This is why, flexibility, all right? This opens and closes airflow. So now we got air pressure, okay? Nice and simple. Gotta hold it between your knees or have somebody else help you. Ah, I'm gonna pour the contents into the bin. Okay, here we go. Now, in order to use this sucker, I put it on the smallest hole. All right guys, fire table day. <laughs> Excited, we're gonna peel this apart like an onion. We're gonna install our gas lines. My gas guy came by and did the connection right into the inside of the pit outside. My boys are here today as well. So we're going to just tear this apart, clean it up, carry it outside, finish installing this bad boy. I can't wait. Ah. It's amazing how much strength is in a little bit of a brad nail. Wow. Just for reference, give you an idea. This is a four foot by eight foot table. And uh, it was seven bags of cement, so 350 pounds. It doesn't actually bond to the concrete. So like, if you're working at home and you're being creative, 
consider the, the rigid insulation because this stuff is so dense and so light makes a perfect hole for my insert. Here we are at my fire pit. Now, my gas guy did the connections for me. He has a main shutoff valve over by the house. And each of these have a gas in, gas out line. So he's done the gas in supply and capped it. The gas is off at the house and with the key. So I'm okay to open this up. So what I got is the yellow gas line tape. And we are going to just go like this and thread it on. Windy today, eh? Holy cow. Now you know why we built this privacy wall. Without this privacy wall, I think the wind would blow my hair right off. There we go. We're gonna just leave that in here. Remember, the table has the holes in it. We'll reach through, pull these up, make our connections, and then recess our fire pit. Three, two, up. Oh, sliding a bit, that's all right. Keep going, keep going, come on, push, guys. Yep. Okay, up, towards Max. Straight waddle, out. waddle, waddle, straight out. Straight outside, no stopping. Damn, I got it. Ah! Why was nobody over there? I was. All right, guys, so full disclosure, yeah, that was kind of scary when the table snapped there. Um, that was a, a weird jagged cut based on us dropping it too hard. Now, um, I want to just give you a little bit of information. If you are in a northern climate and you're going to have a hot table in a cold space in the spring and then fall, you've got to use a wire mesh inside your cement mix. And you've got to make sure that every six or eight inches is meshed and linked together, okay? because there's such an, a huge amount of heat that's concentrated. And when you use the glass, it really holds the heat down the middle of the table. If you're in the south and it's a warmer climate, then you can probably get away with just dropping in the rebar like you've seen in some other videos. But you might not need, need anything at all if you make it small enough. But the point is that if you're dealing with expansion and contraction in cold weather climates, make sure you use the mesh, okay? And even tie it together if you need to to make sure that there's uh, direction changes in the mesh in every part of the table. All right, mine didn't have any of that detail in and around the fire pit crack, and so that's why it damaged so easily. Uh, I feel stupid, but hey, live and you learn, right? So that's my two bits. Let's get on to the rest of the video. Okay, so we took our countertop out and it broke. It was heavy, and we just did not have a good enough plan to be able to stand there and discuss setting it in place gently when we were all dying. So it dropped, it broke. And uh, I'm making a video to show you how I fix it, okay? In the meantime, I just gotta go on with the rest of this countertop instruction video, and we'll assume that your world is perfect and you never make a mistake, and it didn't break. So you can follow this step now, and that is to grab your cup grinding wheel, all right? Now listen, anybody in the, in the business who's gonna be doing concrete should have one of these for their grinder. It's even really good if you're in the tile business, right? and you're dealing with uh, concrete flooring and removing old tile, having a cup grinder around just to get rid of raised sections that are in the way and deal with all those imperfections. This makes a really difficult job, a really simple fix in a hurry. So we're gonna use our cup grinder today because when you pour a countertop, the side that's on the melamine is nice and smooth, no worries. But the underside where you're gonna be sitting, you've gotta get rid of all of those ridges and pointy spots and rough texture from the pour process so that when people are sitting here, they're not shredding themselves and their clothes on your countertop. To do that, we use a cup grinder because this will take the edge off of just about anything. So we're gonna use a combination cup grinder and then wet sanding, okay? But cup grinding just does 90% of the work and then the wet sanding will make it smooth. Thank you. 
Wet sanding is actually a lot simpler than you'd think, and it doesn't require an expensive tool. I got this one on Amazon, 40, maybe $60 Canadian. Great deal, works great, hooks up to your compressor. All right, because you don't want to use electricity with water. <laughs> so anyway, check this out. That's fun, huh? Noisy as hell, but it works. Woo! All right, now you can follow any rules of sanding that you like. It works on hook and loop contact there. So if you're careful, you just line up your hook and loop. Now you're good to go. Package of 50 of these things is only like 10 bucks. I could sand this right clean off. All right, now wet sanding for a reason because um, sanding concrete with water gives you a really nice finish. So we're just going to add a little bit of water to my edge here. Okay. And I'm going to just go ahead and give it a once over. That is awesome. Okay. So what that does is it gives me a perfectly smooth surface and it actually it uh, starts to show a couple of little minor imperfections that are in the concrete. In my mortar joint here, sorry. Like I got a dimple here. Didn't see that coming. But that's because there's one more step here and that is to make a slurry and apply it on the mortar. Okay, so you're making a, like a paste out of the same material you made the countertop with. Gives us ability to fill this kind of stuff in. Come back and wet sand it smooth. It also gives us the ability to make sure that all of these edges are completely polished back. All right. And then, uh, you know, another hour or so, <laughs> it should be finished and ready to go. So the next step, of course, after we have our counter, ah, there we go, is setting in the glass. All right, now the, the, the track that I found at the Home Depot is a little wider than the glass. Um, if you can find an exact 3 8 aluminum track, that'd be ideal, but I had to go with half inch because of what was available. That is the year I live in. Now I'm using a clear silicone product called Ultra Clear from DAP. And it's a sealant adhesive, okay? And I'm just gonna put a nice healthy bead in the bottom of the track and set the glass into it. Now, depending on the condition of your countertop when you're doing this, I'm going with all clear. If you don't have any rough edges that need rework and you just wanna set it in and go with the clear, that, that works. The other option is to set it and forget it if you have the right kind of track, it'll stand straight up. But for me, my track's wide, so it's gonna be sitting kind of lopsided. So I'm setting it in clear. I've cut this wood to fit at the top. I'm gonna to tape it all together. I know it sounds crazy, but it'll work. And then when it's all done, I'm going to have to do some more countertop repair work in my situation. And so I'm gonna make the countertop surface the last batch got a bit of flowability to it, but not too much because I don't want it to crack and flake. I'm going to put all that in, I'm going to tool it, and then I'm going to take the time to take a little bit of that mix right around the edges of my glass and tool it all in nice and sexy like. And when that's all finished, we can wet sand back everything to perfection. The reason I want all the silicone in here, even though I'm adding the, the more cement, is I don't want the thin layer of cement on the countertop to be the thing that creates the strength for the glass. I don't want that to be the bonding agent because that could long-term reach me in brand new problems with cracking and everything else. Let's drop this glass. And when I say drop, I mean place. <laughs> yeah. Just because it's safety glass doesn't mean it's unbreakable. So I just ran into the fridge and I got a couple of cans of soda. I'm gonna use that as something to rest the wood on. And the question I guess today is Pepsi or Coke? What do you prefer? Put your comment in the comment section and let me know. All right, here we go. Oh, ho. that one is too long, not long enough. Okay, I'm actually going the wrong way with that. Now that I got this helper, I want to make sure I'm relatively square here. <laughs> That's going to work, right? Because these are all set in silicone, right? What this is going to do is enable me to have all my glass line up. Because now when the silicone sets, regardless of what goes on with this, the countertop, my glass will all be square and aligned 
it's going to be an amazing look. And I'm not joking about the Pepsi challenge. I want to know. Do you prefer Coke or Pepsi? Seriously. So again, we're using the same mix as we made the countertop with. And this is a, uh, a mortar mix. It's high grade for structural repairs. And that's why we're using it. Just to have a little peace of mind after the fact. Again, when this is set, we'll have to come back with the cup grinder and then wet sand it. But you can see, we have more than enough material there to make a nice looking countertop, right? Now I'm just gonna seal up that glass edge there. This is just gonna be blood, sweat, and tears, guys. But it all comes down to trusting your tools and your products. All right, so we're gonna move on now. I'm gonna come back after this is set, get it all sanded down so you can't see any of the seams and transitions from the different mixes of the mortar because we were making patches and repairs. This is going to make this counter look brand new. I can't wait. Here we go, right? Outdoor living at its finest, double fisting, Canadian style. Listen guys, uh, if you like the idea of setting up yourself to have a paradise in your backyard, you've got to subscribe to this channel. All the videos for everything you see here are coming your way, including the hot tub, the patio. I'm telling you, this is gonna be spectacular. And one of the coolest things about this table is that it's built with building materials that are really easy to get a hold of. The, the, the stand and the ledge stone, the mortar bed here, the glass, this is all off the shelf at Home Depot. And there's going to be links in the video description. You can get a hold of the fire inserts, okay, as well as the blue glass. And that's it. You got a couple of quick purchases on Amazon that are actually in stock and in your home in 48 hours. You could decide to build it this weekend and you'd have no problem knocking this off in a few days. Make sure you guys like and subscribe and hit the bell for notification because I'm telling you, you're not going to want to miss any of the videos coming out soon. If you want, you can click the link right here and you can see our 1880s farmhouse renovation project from the very beginning. Cheers.